that our hope is in him, Amen. that he is always faithful. Amen. And when you get established in that, the grit, the perseverance carries through you through every yeah. single trial yeah. and every single Jeez. circumstance, every single time. Mm -hmm. Because we don't have a vain hope. We don't hope like the world hopes. Amen. We have a sure and constant hope. Mm -hmm. Amen. Yes, Lord. So I've been going through the book of James and going back there tonight mm -hmm. to chapter 3. Now the Lord told me several months ago now, March, read James. And there was a lot going on. A lot of things I was reading. Lots of things I was hearing. And it's like the Lord just arrested my attention to... His word is enough. Mm. And there's certain instructions, yeah. there's certain teaching. Mm -hmm. You know that some of the letters of the New Testament is almost like the code of conduct mm. for the church. Mm. You know, a code of conduct in workplaces, like your standards, your mm. values, that you as an employee subscribe to. You say, yes, I'm going to work for you, and I'm going to abide by this code. And the book of James is one of these code of conduct kind of books. It's like, if you're a part of this body, if you're a part of the church, this is the standard of living. This is the standard of Christ's life mm -hmm. in you. This is what we're um, attaining to. This is what godly living looks like. We sing a song, don't we? This is what living looks like. Yeah, it's not the bouncing yeah. up and down that living looks like. It's living righteous, mm -hmm. it's living holy, it's living pleasing to God. Mm -hmm. And that's what this book is about. So let's go to James chapter 3 and verse 1. It says, My brethren, let not many of you become teachers, knowing that we shall receive a stricter judgment. Mm -hmm. Now I stand tonight in a role of teacher. <laughs> And this is the kind of verse that ought to keep every teacher in check. Yes, Lord. Because every time a teacher, a preacher, mm -hmm. someone declares the word of God from the front, they're accountable for that word, mm -hmm. not just in their own lives, not in just how it reflects upon them, but in every single person who's <coughs> listening and what they do with that word. And Jesus said, to call no one teacher. You remember that? He says, don't call anyone yeah. teacher. I'm the teacher. Mm -hmm. So, teacher, in terms of a title, is only ascribed to Jesus. He is the teacher. But teaching is a function and a gift, and it's a role within the church. It's not a position, it's not a title. Mm -hmm. Now, Today's culture, I don't think we esteem teaching anywhere near as close as they esteem teaching back in when this was being written. You know, the role of rabbi was just, oh, they were, they were the celebrity status, right? Everybody wanted to have that position of rabbi. They were the ones who had a little group of followers following them around. Jesus wasn't the only one with disciples, you know that. We're told John had disciples, and every pocket, every rabbi would have had a pocket of disciples. But we have replaced that esteem for people like the celebrity Christian culture type mm -hmm. people, all the names that we can <laughs> put in their pockets. Um, you know, you, you can list a few. And what's really somber is that in recent months and years, we've seen big name ministries falling mm. because of one person, one big name, sin being exposed publicly because there was never a private dealing with it. Mm -hmm. And it's really sad. Mm -hmm. It's really sad that ministries crumble based on one person's sin. Mm -hmm. Whereas teaching and preaching should be equipping every single person within the hearing of that word to stand and to know the teacher, to know Jesus. Amen. So I can stand quite confidently 
And I'm, I know it says, be careful where, where you stand, lest you fall. But and say, you know, if, if things went rotten in New Wine Church, I'd still be standing and listening to Jesus. Yes, Lord. And every one of us should be able to say the same. So I have no anticipation of that happening. <laughs> But my faith is not based on Donnie's teaching. Mm-hmm. Neither should your faith be based on what I or anybody else says from the front. But we should be inspiring mm-hmm. every single person to go and find out what Jesus says. Mm-hmm. Find out what the Spirit of the Lord says. Mm-hmm. Find out what God is saying in his word mm-hmm. to his church, but on a personal one-to-one level. If the only time we hear from God is on a Sunday morning or evening, or maybe Wednesday night, then it is not the preacher's fault. It's not the teacher's fault if we're not experiencing what God says. Jesus says, don't put a man in the place of me. Where we replace Jesus with our favourite teacher is a recipe for disaster. Mm -hmm. It says that teachers receive a stricter judgment. You know, the word stricter is megas, meaning mega. It means greater, bigger, more intense judgment. That, that is solemn, mm-hmm. and it should be. You know that we serve a holy God, mm-hmm. and his standard is way up here. That's right. And when we minimize, when we minimize his holiness, that's where we fall into error. That's mm-hmm. where we get into shaky grounds as to what we're teaching, mm-hmm. and preaching, and proclaiming, and anything else. So it, it's really important, and I know, um, I, I said it, like, I, I love the teaching in New Wine Church, and it's important to honour the teaching and the preaching where the Lord's planted us, because he speaks through those gifts. He's designed church to work this way, but they are not the teacher. Mm-hmm. So people who have seen Jesus as their teacher, the Holy Spirit as their teacher, Father God as their teacher, then no matter what comes, they're going to weather every storm Mm -hmm. because they know where to go for every answer. They know where to go for every lesson that needs to be learned because we can all get wobbly at times. My brethren, let not many of you become teachers. It doesn't say none of you become teachers. It says just don't let many of you become teachers. Realize the cost that it is to be a teacher and a preacher. I've got a few T's tonight, by the way, for for going through this passage. So the first T is teaching, the second T is talking. So verse 2, I'm going to read down to verse 12. It says, For we all stumble in many things. If anyone does not stumble in words, he is a perfect man, able also to bridle the whole body. Indeed, we put bits in horses' mouths, that they may obey us, and we turn their whole body. Look also at ships, although they are large, and are driven by fierce winds, they are turned by a very small rudder wherever the pilot desires. Even so, the tongue is a little member and boasts great things. See how great a forest a little fire kindles. And the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. The tongue is so set among our members that it defiles the whole body and sets on fire the course of nature. And it sets it set, sorry, and it is set on fire by hell. For every kind of beast and bird, of reptile and creature of the sea, is tamed and has been tamed by mankind. But no man can tame the tongue. It is an unruly evil full of deadly poison. With it we 
we bless our God and Father, and with it we curse men, who have been made in the similitude, likeness of God. Out of the same mouth proceed blessing and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not to be so. Does a spring send forth fresh water and bitter from the same opening? Can a fig tree, my brethren, bear olives or a grapevine bear figs? Thus no spring yields both salt water and fresh. In Matthew 12 and verses 35 to 37, it says, A good man, out of the good treasure of his heart, brings forth good things. And an evil man, out of the evil treasure, brings forth evil things. But I say to you that for every idle word men speak, they will give an account of it in the day of judgment. For by your words you will be justified, and by your words you will be condemned. <coughs> it's interesting to me that it starts with one verse about teaching and then starts talking about the importance of the way that we are speaking and using our tongue. And mm -hmm. talking about this perfect man, that's a mature man. Now, you know that we're being <clears throat> matured, don't you? We're growing up in the Lord. From the moment we got saved to this moment right now, we ought to be <laughs> getting more and more mature in Christ, becoming more and more perfect in Christ. So there's a sense that this doesn't happen overnight. Mm. It doesn't happen overnight that suddenly our, our language is going to be turned around. Sometimes it does. Some people have got saved and instantly every every cuss word has disappeared. Every, but you know, you know the phrase, old habits die hard. Mm. We have been really, really well versed. We've been well, well practiced in talking contrary to the word of God, mm -hmm. to living outside of faith. Remember last time we spoke about um, whatever is not of faith, whatever doesn't come from faith is sin, and that importance of recognizing and remaining in a place of faith. Mm -hmm. Well, our language needs to catch up with mm -hmm. that. It's just a follow on here. It's like, yeah, you show me your works, you show me your <laughs> you tell me you Say you have faith, but you don't have the works. Well, this is properly integrity. Mm -hmm. When our words match our faith. In Matthew 12 there it says that we'll have to give an account for every idle word. You know, an idle, something that's idle is inactive. Mm -hmm. It's ineffective. Mm -hmm. It's not producing anything. Uh, you know, when a car is idling. Is making a lot of noise and going nowhere. <laughs> how, how, how many things are making a lot of noise <laughs> and going nowhere? Mm -hmm. And throughout the, the New Testament, idle words is babbling, idle words, talking nonsense, deceiving many. These are the kind of things that we're taught to be on guard against, to watch against. So, our initial confession of faith when we said Jesus Christ is Lord, when we believed in our hearts and confessed with our mouths, that was enough to justify us. Mm -hmm. But everything else in our soul, in our hearts, needs to catch up with that justification. That's the working out our faith with fear and trembling. Mm -hmm. It's like, I need to raise up to this standard. The Holy Spirit has to be at work in my life and it has to be evident. You know he does it. But he doesn't do it without partnership. He doesn't do it without us being involved in the process. We can't be sitting, making all the right noises, and going nowhere. It doesn't work. We can repeat back verbatim, verbatim everything we hear week in, week out. But if it's not making a change in our lives, then who's at fault there? Mm -hmm. Is it the one who promised? Mm -hmm. No. Is it the messenger? No. No. The book of James is getting us, asking us, pleading with us 
to be accountable mm. for the change that is happening in our lives. To be accountable for the way that we interact with each other. And to be accountable to God for every word that we speak. So it takes a bit of maturing to manage our tongue. Mm. But it's not an effort that is without a helper. Mm -hmm. I like um, David wrote, and I can't remember if it's in the Psalms or if it's somewhere else, but it's like, I put a guard over my mouth mm -hmm. that I might not speak. And sometimes we need to be proactive in putting that guard over our mouths. Remember Thumper and Bambi. Anybody remember that film? So the little rabbit, Pumper, he's got this little adage, it's like, if you can't say anything nice, don't say anything at all. Mm -hmm. I think his mum catches him in the middle of saying something nasty about one of his pals or something. And you know, if we can't say anything that is not in line with God's words, yeah. don't say anything at all. Yeah. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 11, it says, If anyone speaks, let him speak as the oracles of God. We've been hearing and being reminded of as well that anyone who is joined with the Lord is one spirit with him. We are the expression of God's spirit, of the Holy Spirit on earth. If anything is going to happen on earth as it is in heaven, it's through his people, mm -hmm. who he has set up in a place to bring heaven to earth, to pray, our Father in heaven, mm -hmm. hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done. He does everything on earth through partnership mm -hmm. with his people. So just imagine for, for a moment with me that every word, every single word, word that we speak is as the oracles of God, as if God himself is speaking mm. through us. How many idle words does that leave us with? Mm. That's a challenge. Mm. It doesn't say if anybody preaches, let him preach. Mm -hmm. It doesn't say if anyone prophesies, let him prophesy. It might say that elsewhere. Let them do it as the mm -hmm. Spirit of the Lord gives them utterance. Let them do. It's like if anybody speaks, any word, as the oracles of God, as though God Himself was talking through us. And I love the imagery in James chapter 3 of, of you know, we put the horse, we put the bit in the horse's mouth. Now, a very, very long time ago when I was little, like probably this high, um, I, was, I, was, I was four. <laughs> no. Um, we lived in a place where a lot of my school pals had stables and horses and horse riding places. We didn't, we didn't have any of that. <laughs> but my friends did, which meant birthday parties were brilliant because I got to go and ride horses. And they would put you on the back of the horse and somebody would lead you around. And they would obviously pick the meekest horse, the best trained horse to put these little, little people on. And I remember winning my first rosette for anything, riding on the back of a horse in a little derby thing that they had on for us. Yeah, I was before I was eight years old, so. But... If I had tried that with a wild horse that hadn't been tamed, or a horse that was um, untried, untested, little Kirsty, little me, wouldn't have uh, lasted very long. Mm -hmm. And James is like turning our tongues to that. That it takes training for us to get our tongues to line up with God's word. Even with the ships, you know, uh, the little rudder does a lot of turning, but it takes a long time to turn the ship around, doesn't it? And a tiny little speck of flame 
a tiny little bit of heat on some kindling, on some dry wood, is going to send a forest up in smoke. Mm -hmm. How much more, we like that word, how much more then, when we're speaking God's word, do we turn things around? Mm. How much more when we're getting in line with what God is saying and speaking, when we're speaking as the oracles of God, <coughs> will we see change? Will we see manifestations of <coughs> his word? The things that he said we are supposed to follow us when we line up with what God is saying? When we say what he says, when we do what he does, when we're in line and when we're listening to him. We like fire as well. We talk about fire, revival fires, or, or fire, you know, just going through the place like wildfire. Well, if one idle word or one mm -hmm. wicked word coming out of a place that's like evil heart can cause <coughs> destruction and cause <coughs> all sorts of carnage, then one word that likes to spark in the kingdom, for the kingdom, for God's sake, sets a world aflame for him. Mm -hmm. Our words are just that important. And all of this is to, to say, it doesn't happen in, we can't make ourselves no. perform better. Mm -hmm. We can't make ourselves any more holy or any more righteous, or any more justified than we already are, but our willingness to be just like Jesus, mm -hmm. and reflecting, being anointed by the Holy Spirit, every day, every moment, acknowledging His presence right there with us, makes a world of difference. That's the difference between seeing and not seeing. Mm -hmm. It's acknowledging his presence. We can say all the right words. We can be in all the right places. We can be even hearing from God and repeating what he says. But unless our hearts are in it, unless we're aligned and believing and in faith and all those things, then we may as well be that climbing yeah. of a simple. And it speaks about if you don't have love. Mm -hmm. The only way we have any kind of love for brothers and sisters or for anybody we come across in the world is because the Holy Spirit pours it into our hearts. Mm -hmm. We have to be yielded to Him. We have to be... You know, we use words like yielded or <laughs> submitted or whatever. It's in daily friendship and daily relationship <coughs> with him. <coughs> we want our mouths to be lining up with what's really going on with our hearts. What that born again heart, that spirit heart that we've been given. That's that's integrity, isn't it? When we're speaking like, acting like whom God has already created us to be, who has already recreated us to be, not out of who we used to be, not out of the old habits mm. or the, the way we've always acted. We make loads of excuses. Oh, that's just so and so, or that's just me, I can't help it, I just go straight to this reaction, that reaction. We can help it a lot mm -hmm. in that place of submission, mm -hmm. in that place of coming into, you know, going boldly into the throne room. <laughs> Was it to find, obtain, mercy. obtain mercy and find grace? Yeah. I always get them confused. No, I don't always get them confused. I'm learning to get them right. <laughs> our code of conduct. This is what the Spirit of the Lord expects from his church. That's why James is writing it. Say, hey church, this is the standard. Come up to the standard. 
So verse 13, it says, Who is wise and understanding among you? Let him show by good conduct that his works are done in the meekness of wisdom. But if you have bitter envy and self-seeking in your hearts, do not boast and lie against the truth. So in the next couple of verses, we're going to look at wisdom and the different types of wisdom. But here tells us where the source mm. of these types of wisdom are. And the source of what wisdom we're working according to is in our attitude. Who is wise and understanding? Anybody wise? Anyone understanding? No. I think I like to think I'm wise. I have, I have blinding moments of brilliance sometimes. Um, and then it's usually followed up by some blinding moments of, of just insanity or silliness. <laughs> you know, one of those moments where you're like, oh, we should do this, and everyone's like, wow, oh, that, that's a brilliant idea, or whatever, and then you go and say something, and it's like, are you even the same person? <laughs> I think it's a bit like Peter as well, where it's like, <laughs> you know, the revelation, like, you are, you are the, the Messiah, and then the next minute is like, no, you're not going to die, and Jesus says, get behind me, Satan, and he goes from wisdom to very not wisdom in the matter mm. of seconds. <laughs> but his good conduct is what shows up if he's wise and understanding. My good conduct and my meekness it's not, not look at me, I'm really, really clever. <laughs> It's the meekness, it's the attitude that determines where the wisdom is coming from. Same with the bitter envy and self-seeking in your hearts. That's what determines what kind of wisdom you're performing, you're, you're under. It says in verse 15, And this wisdom does not descend from above, but it is earthly, sensual, demonic. That's the wisdom that comes from the bitter envy and the self-seeking in our hearts and boasting and lying against the truth. That is the earthly, sensual and demonic. Natural. And devoid of God. He's not in it. You know, that's, there are loads and loads of kind of self-help gurus. There are loads and loads of um, what do you call it, the kind of business, you know TED Talks, you all know what TED Talk is, but you get some expert in their field telling people how to have great teams, or how to have brilliant working environments, or how to look after their mental health, mm -hmm. or, you know, all these kind of things. And some of it might be very good wisdom, but if the source of it isn't coming from the Lord, then it is nothing but being earthly, sensual, and demonic. Mm -hmm. It says, for where there is envy and self-seeking, there's confusion and every evil thing are there. That's our checklist for wisdom. Mm -hmm. That doesn't come from above. That doesn't come from God. It's earthly, it's central, demonic. So it's envious. It's seeking its own, it's causing confusion, and there's nothing good that comes from that. It's coming from that place of envy or self-promotion even. How many of the, the counsellors, the teachers, the gurus outside of the church are delivering wisdom for the sake of selling their next book. Mm -hmm. Or they're not sell a business conference, which is ridiculous money. Mm -hmm. <laughs> How many in the church are doing exactly the same thing? Mm -hmm. Verse 17, but the wisdom that is from above 
and this is a checklist for heavenly wisdom, says, it is first pure, mm -hmm. then peaceable, Gee. gentle, willing to yield, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. Now the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. It is first pure. Pure is holy, sacred, undefiled. It's not coming out of self-promotion. It's not coming out of self-anything. It's coming out of a right alignment with heaven. It's coming as the Holy Spirit leads us. And it has no coercion in it. It has no... Mm -hmm dirtiness about it. Who's heard teaching at times or preaching at times or you know big conference and something just feels a little bit sticky and dirty about it. And maybe you don't know exactly what doesn't feel right. I'll use feel because it's you know our spiritual senses are supposed to be discerning and sometimes we don't have natural words for the way that we pick up things in the spirit. But you feel something's off about this. And it might be all the right words. It might be good wisdom. But the heart behind it, the attitude behind it, is wrong. And when you go and start having a dig, if you're so inclined, not always advisable. But you find out that there's things going on behind the scenes, or accusations, or, or dirtiness. And it's not wisdom then that is pure and undefiled, it's wisdom that is earthly, sensual, and demonic. It might be the same words, but coming from a very, very different spirit. So it's pure, it's holy, sacred, and undefiled, it's peaceable, or peaceful. So it brings peace. Sometimes we, let's, I'll say I, Sometimes I think I'm being wise and bringing wisdom, but what I'm actually doing is bringing an argument. I'm not, I'm not in it to create peace or to bring peace to the person. I'm in it to prove that I'm right about something. That wisdom might be correct wisdom, but if it's coming from the wrong source, the wrong spirit, mm -hmm. then it's nothing short than being earthly, sensual, and demonic. Mm -hmm. It's about me looking good or me proving something or me promoting myself. Wisdom that comes from above is peaceable. It's peaceful. It's gentle. And meanings behind gentle is equitable and fair. Mm -hmm. it's, it's just, we could say. Mm -hmm. It's doing the right thing for every party. It's not compromising. It's not, it's not a fairness or an equity like the world talks about, because we're all about equity in the world as well. But from the Spirit of the Lord, it's going to bring equity to everyone. It's going to be fair for everyone. Why? Because God is no respecter of persons. What he's done for me is done for you. What's available to me is available to you, regardless. And he treats, he treats us all, he judges us all by exactly the same measure. And this measure is the sum. Mm -hmm. It's Jesus. Boiled well, right the way down whether or not we've accepted him. That's why he judges us. So, did you accept my son? Yep. Yeah. Great. <laughs> On you go. Did you accept my son? Uh, no. Well, then let's have a look at your works. Let's have a look at your um, your words. Let's have a look at everything. <laughs> Gentle is also translated reasonable. So able to be reasoned with. Wisdom that comes from God, comes from above, isn't afraid of questions. Mm. 
No, wisdom that is from that other spirit will sometimes get offended mm -hmm. if you think something different. Mm -hmm. If you've got a counter argument, if you've got something that is contrary to this is what you should do right now. But wisdom that comes from God, you can, you can reason with it. You can say, right, so what about this and what about that? Because remember earlier in James it says, if any of you lacks wisdom, ask of God. He doesn't mind. <laughs> He's not going to think any less of you for asking. That is the wisdom that this is talking about. God's wisdom that says, you can ask me anything and I'll explain it to you. Mm -hmm. It is willing to yield, ready to obey, to obey or compliant, that means. Wisdom that comes from above is not wisdom that the person who's delivering the word is not willing to perform themselves. I got trapped in that sentence. But <laughs> if somebody is saying, this is what you should do, and it's not something that they would do themselves, it is not coming from God, mm -hmm. categorically. Or at least it is not coming from the spirit of God through that person. It might be the right thing, it might be what the word says, but unless that person is in the wisdom that comes from above, mm -hmm. is in right alignment with the spirit of God, who is the spirit of wisdom, mm -hmm. then it is exactly the same as if it was the wrong word, a bad bit of wisdom, bad bit of advice that is earthly, sensual, and demonic. It depends on where the source is. And you tell it by this attitude that we're willing to, willing to yield. It's like, you know, we've spoken about unity and, and we say, the wise yielded to the Holy Spirit, but you know there's a yieldedness to each other that we should also have. Submitting to one another in love. So if Andy comes along, as my dear husband, and has a bit of wisdom for me, to receive that wisdom, I need to yield to that wisdom. But if I react badly to that wisdom, him reacting badly to me reacting badly is not going to get that wisdom to me. Yeah. So saying, okay, you're not ready to receive that just now. <laughs> I'll come back. I'll try another tact. The third T, by the way, is tact. This is what I believe this is talking about. Tact. Tact is diplomacy. And a diplomat is a representative of a kingdom in a different culture, a di uh, um, <laughs> when they go abroad, what's the other word for it? Ambassador. It's the same, same word. We're supposed to be ambassadors of Christ. So we should be skilled in the art of diplomacy. This is kingdom diplomacy, wisdom. It's dealing tactfully with people. Full of mercy and good fruits. Mercy is also translated as compassion. If the wisdom, or so-called wisdom that we're being, we're hearing, isn't full of compassion, if the wisdom we think we're delivering isn't full of compassion and mercy and love for the person we're speaking to, we are not in the wisdom that comes from above, we're in the other type. Does that make sense? It's all about where our hearts are. And good fruits is the good deeds. This wisdom produces something. There's going to be a harvest on what is said in the wisdom that comes from above. It is without partiality, or it's unwavering. So it's without uncertainty. It isn't sometimes this and sometimes that. It isn't that double-minded man that we 
looked at elsewhere in genes. It isn't being tossed around by it. Mm. all the winds of different teaching. It is this is what the word says, and this is what the spirit of God is saying. We can have all the right words. <coughs> But be in the holy wrong place. It's without hypocrisy. So it's unfeigned. It isn't putting on an act. It's full of integrity. That's our checklist for wisdom. So... We, we really can, and um, I think we do have the right words a lot of the time. Mm -hmm. We know what to say, because we've been taught well. Mm -hmm. Or we know what the word says, and we know what we ought to believe. Or we think we know that somebody ought to do in a situation, or how we ought to respond in a situation. But unless it is in that place of relationship with God, with the Holy Spirit, it could very easily be coming from an earthly, sensual, and demonic attitude. Mm -hmm. Because we don't have the answers. We don't have wisdom of ourselves. We can't even get our tongues in line <laughs> unless we're being yielded to the Holy Spirit, unless we're hearing from God, unless we're willing to partner with him in being transformed and renewing our mind in growing as his dear children. But everything, and it always does, comes back to relationship with the Holy Spirit. Relationship with God. Wisdom from God is the diplomacy and it's the tact of the kingdom. So we've had teaching, we've had talking, and we've had tact. That's our three, <laughs> three T's. That it all boils down to really what comes out of our mouths we're accountable to. And It matters. It matters how we conduct ourselves. It matters how we speak. And yet there's grace and yes there's mercy and yes we make mistakes. That's inevitable. We're not that perfect man yet. Because we're being our souls are still being transformed. But we get to, we get to submit to God. We get to anticipate being wiser, being more <coughs> full of him, being more like him as we grow, as we develop, as we commit ourselves to him, as we submit and yield ourselves to him. Not just on a Sunday, not just on... <laughs> on an evening when you're hearing a message like this that, I mean, <laughs> very easily you could get a bit worried, you could get a bit concerned, oh, what about this and what about that thing and, you know, where am I slipping and those kind of questions might arise, but all he's looking for is us, a relationship with us in that moment by moment way, in that day by day way. So James 1 started, we looked at this interaction between us and the Lord, between us and others, and the responsibility to manage ourselves. And I give you the acronym of JOY. So it's Jesus, others, you, in that order, is how you have joy. In James 2, we spoke about faith and 
that faith has substance. Faith produces something. And the importance of recognizing when we are in faith or when we're out of faith. Because whatever is not of faith is sin. And here we're looking at the importance of every word that comes out of our mouths. You know that not a single word that comes out of the mouth of God returns to him void. But it accomplishes that for which it is sent. That should be, can be, the same way that our words go out from us. That we don't have idle words. They don't fall to the ground and produce nothing. But every word is full of fruit. It's bearing life. It's bringing God right into the midst of that situation. It's only God's word that the Holy Spirit can confirm. This is our conduct, our code of conduct in the body of Christ. This is integrity. This is walking by the Spirit. This is what it looks like. And we know the Holy Spirit never ever comes to condemn us. But he will convict us. And that conviction is such a good thing. Mm -hmm. Because it's an opportunity to allow him to burn up things that aren't of him. It's opportunity for us to be refined like that gold in the furnace. So all those things come to the top, it gets skimmed off, it goes back in, it gets refined a little bit more. I like the idea of going through life getting refined. Mm -hmm. I, I quite like the idea of being refined, really. <laughs> so we're maturing, so we're growing, so we're becoming more and more like Jesus through every passing day. And so that we reflect him and represent him well. So that the wisdom that we bring to other people is directly from heaven. So that it'll cause a, a change. Mm. It'll bring people into a relationship or a, even seeing that, wow, this, this God that she's talking about, <laughs> this Jesus who they've told me about, they actually do what, what she said they would do. That the Bible actually is real and for today. That there's something to this. Something to this faith. It's not just a, a, another club to join or another party to be a part of. Or, you know, it's something that is real and relevant and makes all the difference in the world. To individuals. So that's the end of James chapter 3. We'll pray and then we'll pass back over. Father, I'm asking tonight by your Holy Spirit that you would that you pull us up on anything that isn't of you, where our words have been wasteful, where they've been idle, even where we know that we've spoken from reaction out of the flesh, out of our old habits, out of the way that we used to be, or acted in ways that are contrary to who you are and who you are in us. Just as the psalm say, Father, that you would search us and know us and see if there's any wicked way in us. Because we want to be clean. We want to be pure. We want to be holy as you are holy. Father, I thank you that you 
you're not keeping a record of our sins, but you still, you still desire repentance and a turnaround. Mm. A turnaround of our thinking, a change. Father, it's almost like we, we, we change little by little by repenting, by changing our minds. By recognizing the things that aren't from you, that aren't glorifying, that don't bring glory to your name. And when we repent of them, we, we don't have to live by them anymore. That there's grace to live free of those things. Mm. Father, for those who, who teach in whatever capacity, Father, I thank you for the, the gravity of your word. I thank you that you make it really, really clear just how important and how honourable teaching should be and is. And Father, I just pray that you'd impress on our hearts, on our minds, in a stronger way. That you'd pull us up, that you'd convict us when we're, we're not in line. In that moment, so we can repent quickly. So we can keep things fresh, keep things pure, keep things glorifying. So we can keep yielded. So that people would learn from you and get to know you as teacher. Get to see you through the words that we speak. And that we would be great diplomats on earth. Great ambassadors for your kingdom not just in name, not just in the message that we bring, but in the authority and the power that we carry, because you go with us, confirming your word with the accompanying signs and wonders. Father, every moment, every circumstance, every situation we find ourselves facing, even when we see friends and loved ones and people that we know in our communities coming up against horrible things, things that were never your intention. Father, I pray, Lord, that we would go to you first, that we would go to the spirit of understanding, the spirit of wisdom, that we would go and ask you for wisdom. Rather than coming up with the good ideas that we're so good at, Coming up with the things that we think are right because we heard someone <coughs> say it once or because we know that the word says that, but that we would be hearing a word from you in season. The word of wisdom, the word of knowledge, that is the fitting thing for that moment. That is the key for unlocking hearts. That is the thing that will open up your kingdom to people. And that you, through us, would beckon people to yourself. Draw them in. Father, we just want to glorify you. We just want to be like you. Imitators of you as your dear children. Mm. Father, I thank you that your work isn't done yet. But you've started a good work and you are faithful to complete it in each of us. And that you already view us as perfect. You already view us as justified, as sanctified, as set apart, as all these things. We're already that beautiful bride without blemish and without fault. We can already stand in your presence unashamed and knowing that we've been forgiven of all unrighteousness. 
But Father, help us to help us to get our souls in line, to get the history gone and dead and buried where it ought to be, mm-hmm. and to be living according to you, the leading of your Holy Spirit. Thank you for this word tonight and pray, Lord, that it would go down deep, that it would do the work that you sent it, and it won't return to you void. Family, expect to have a harvest from these words sown. in righteousness by those who make peace. Father, I thank you we live at peace with you. Be glorified through us in Jesus' name, I ask. Amen.